Congratulations, Professor Nana Jinopokwa Jiman, the first female Vice Chancellor of a public university in Ghana, on your selection and acceptance to be our party's running mate. Together, we have made the best choice for Ghana. A few days ago, the National Democratic Congress outdoored its first female vice presidential aspirant, Professor Jinana Opukwajiman. So I sought to speak to spokesperson for the NDC, Joyce Bawa Mokhtari, about what this could mean for the NDC's electoral fortunes and for women in Ghana. She also addresses the Montier 3 matter, which seems to be one of the few attacking points from the opposition since the good professor's nomination. Stay tuned. John Dramani, ma'am, obviously we had, you know, issues. We all saw the people that were up for this particular nomination. And we had obviously had issues that John Mahama may have had a lot of challenges uh, trying to choose her, challenges from the party, uh, especially because, like you said, she hasn't exactly been active in our body politics. Uh, was this decision, decision popular with the base? I think there were other people who wanted to be nominated as well. And at some point, you know, there's a certain subtle campaign going on. Yes, it's not so obvious. But it's there. You find some key people who will be out there due to their pronouncements, the things they do. You know, there will be some whatever. And of course, in every association, there are many people too who have interests and in groups. However, one thing we all know is that once the choice is made, we rally around the Everyone. For those of us who have worked with her, who have experienced her, and who know her, it wasn't a surprise. If anybody could have been running me at this time, then just as well, it could have also been exactly. She's no mean a person. She's a professor par excellence. She is multilingual, well traveled, well educated, an intelligent woman, a God fearing woman, a woman with sterling qualities. I think that Nana Jane Pukojima is well qualified to serve us running mates and possibly. Vice President of this Republic. We see situations where presidential candidates are a bit antsy to let their, you know, vice presidential candidates really shine through. Like we've seen with a lot of vice presidents, not just because she's a woman, no, but because vice presidents themselves, you know, have not exactly been shining stars because they are not even allowed to be. What kind of vice president will the, uh, the professor be if? this NDC government is able to come to power, uh, this NDC is able to come into government again. I don't see Professor Nana Jinnapokwajina in any way as a pushover. I also do not see her as someone who would even have a voice and not express it or use it. I also believe that she comes to the table with very strong principles of her own. Principles of virtuousness, principles of being a mother, principles of an educationist, of a role model, she has a reputation that she would guard very jealously. She is a safe pair of hands. She's an effective leader. And as I said, this is a person whose leadership qualities were identified even by her peers long before anybody heard about her. I have no doubt that in going to nominate Professor Nana Jena Jena, that President Mahama knows very well that he needed someone he could also rely on, someone he could work with, someone who would lead this country to a place where we all want it to be. He also required a human being with a certain vision that is all hers for Ghana. That she comes onto this ticket is first and foremost to compliment the efforts of President Mahama. And I look forward to this ticket being validated through the electorate, that Ghanaians will elect John Mahama to lead this country so they will see the impact that Professor Nana Jena Kukwajima would make. But then you have people also saying that at the end of the day, Professor Nana Kukwajima is not the flag bearer at the end of the day, is still going to be the same NDC government except with a different vice president. 
it was a, it's a trending hashtag on Twitter. It's him, not her. Even if she's the most wonderful leader in the world, how is that one person's leadership going to transform the whole party and rid it of some of the, the problems that obviously caused the 2016 defeat? I recall many years ago when uh, then candidate Akufuado picked out his uh, running mate. They were not lucky the first time. The nomination fell flat. It was at best not very lackluster. People weren't even sure what to expect. They came back four years later. They had done their homework and came back with enormous aggression. They made many promises. They assured people that there will be milk and honey running through our taps. Ghanaians went for it. In the process, there was also a process of some perception that emerged about the then ruling government. I believe that President Mahama is still one of the most reassuring individuals that could ever leave Ghana at any time. He has a certain vision about the Ghana that we all want. Nobody says that the government was perfect or that whatever issues we all suffered at the time created a perfect picture. But I don't think that what we have now is perfect either. Well, I don't think... You have steady electricity. Well, because a lot of investment was made by the then government, really, to stem the canker that had actually engulfed everybody. And remember that except for politics and partisanship, the issues to do with power generation had nothing to do really with government. Mostly, we needed to change from the hydro hydraulic uh, power, uh, you know, Akosombo and all these buoy dam and things, and move to gas as an option. Because with gas, you can buy it to power the new plants. All these independent power producers actually came up at a time when Mr. Mahama was in office. It required deep thinking. We had gotten used to relying on hydro. And suddenly, climate change had happened. The rain patterns were not the same. So it was becoming difficult for these dams to satisfy us. Our population had grown exponentially. So certainly this called for a certain strong leadership to even deal with it. Remember that, look, what are our budgets over us? We have huge infrastructure deficits. We have huge poverty targets that we must meet. It was never an easy option at the time. We built the Atuabu gas plant to be able to feed these independent power plants that had come up as a result. So a lot of effort had gone in. Be that as it may, there is always a very key role that the choice of the running mate makes to a ticket. Let us never think on any day that the MPP's own, you know, perceptions or their ideas in any way reflect on us in the NDC. The NDC is still one of the most, if not the most, successful political parties in Ghana. That wish the party away or not, if you're a true Democrat, you do know that for all the successes that we have chopped, look, the New Majority Party has built no public investments ever. Look at the history of Ghana. Check on what happened with rural electrification. All of these inventions, inventions started with the PNDC and then the NDC. The we actually, absolutely, of course, why not? Remember that Kwame Nkuma himself, in his own wisdom, had started a pseudo-free education for most of us of Northern heritage. It had gone on for many years. So yes, spreading it to the good people of Ghana was certainly not a bad idea. But you also recall, I think that it was because we had hesitated because we had wanted to develop a certain progressive approach to it. The Constitution itself, understanding the nature of our economy, encouraged us to work towards a progressively free senior high school system. So if somebody were to come and meet all the infrastructure developments that are taking place and decides, okay, it's time for me to augment it and then decide to take it to the next level, a new government comes and decides why not. But of course, ask yourself, what takes away from this aspect of it is that most of the other projects that were left which were going to serve the good people of Ghana as well. But because they lacked this populist appeal, those ones were not things that government was interested in. So, you know, there is a certain extreme partisanship that makes it very, very difficult for us to be objective in the way we analyze things. I recall President Akufuado, 
who felt constrained to explain to us why he had been unable in 2008, despite his own personal preference, to nominate a female as his running mate. Now your colleague of possible contender goes out there to nominate a female. If I were in the shoes of the government, I would send out a very beautiful congratulatory message. I will admit that this is a, you know, going to be an interesting contest. As the outdooring, um, he did say that 30% of his cabinet is going to be made up of women, which I, do, I still do not think is, 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 is enough. But then what has changed? Because this same government was in power, you know, some four years or so ago, some four, six years ago, and the percentages of, you know, nominations for women were not that much. It wasn't, there was no, uh, there was no difference. Mm. And do you know how many women were offered opportunities at all levels? So they turned them down. The woman will say first, let me go and consult my family and come back. And I can bet you, once they say that, it means they are not coming back. Everything that has to do with the Ghanaian, both male and female, is a matter that actually most leaders contend with. I believe that uh, President Mahama in his day was very conscious about the need for women to be brought into the decision-making space all table. I do know that he was actually very active in supporting participation and uh, contesting for parliament, for example. But remember that in 2012, out of 200 parliamentarians, only 16 were women. In 2016, to date, out of 275, we only have 36 female parliamentarians. So even at that level, the representation is very low. I do know that in recent times, the NDC and the NPP have both slashed uh, filing fees for women. Yes, and there's some kind of affirmative action in the MPP where women are uncontested. Does the NDC have something similar? It's a very similar thing, but the question is that in all of the seats that we had in 2012, only 102 had female contestants. So it tells you that even despite that dispensation, there's still something that makes it difficult for women to go in the contest for these parliamentary seats. I believe that every government can do more. I am a woman. And I believe genuinely that women are more disciplined, that women comport themselves in certain ways, that women are also less risk averse. They take risks that they know will benefit somebody one way or the other if there's a need. For example, there's a life in mm -hmm. And I listened yesterday to Nana, I was very touched by the fact that she said we should not even have maternal mortality at all. Not at all. Not in the 21st century. No. We really shouldn't be marking time. We should have gone beyond where we are today. If you look at the example of Ethiopia, where they now have a female component of 50% of a cabinet, can't we is actually making some progress. Of course. It's very obvious. Even in countries where females are leaders and females are presidents and prime ministers, yeah. you can be sh you, you will see how compassionate the leadership is. So there's still some practices within our society that militate against the cause of women, that don't help us rise as high as we want to rise. But I believe many women have trailed these same blazes. They've opened and trailed or traveled the same pathways. Well, why must we work twice? But I think I that I'm does. sure that going by what Professor Nana Fokwajima said yesterday, through grit and hard work, remember that even for the men folk, most of the most successful men, work very hard. So I think that when it comes to hard work, when it comes to it commitment, about hard work. I think it is, a, it is a shared thing. A he's working hard. A woman goes out and is working hard, but I mean, it's there. At some point, she has to stop, have babies, look after the babies, make sure they're big enough, make sure that they're safe. Because society has forced certain responsibilities on women without giving them the leeway but, you know, but to you know, succeed. But Shida, you can tell that these are all things that are gradually changing. They are now, but at least there's a certain effort that has been made. I mean, I remember in times when women who were pregnant women could be sacked. You don't get a lot of that anymore. I remember times when you'd go to work late and possibly say your child is unwell, or in fact, once you have a baby even, yes, the whole attitude in the workplace, baby. exactly. All of those things, gradually, I've seen how our men folk now even are more supportive than they used to be. I mean, my younger sister is a doctor, and she tells me how there's an interesting 
trend now. Most of the women who come in to have babies, you find the men lurking in the corridors mm -hmm. and asking to be in the labor rooms and all. So I think that gradually things are changing. We will get there. It will not happen overnight. But as I said, it is why it is important that Nana is actually on the cusp of making history. And I look forward to us having this conversation as we go along so that eventually she will bring to bear on these conversations a very personal touch, her own personal experiences. I mean, you speak about these sanity towels for young women. I remember my mother as a teacher, and a number of times she'd use her own money to buy sanity towels for girls who were unable to afford them, who didn't even know how to use them. So these are all things that ordinary people have grappled with in their ordinary places of work. But they are not issues that ever became public. And I recall when this conversation around these sanity towels came up in Parliament, the Ministry of Education at the time was subjected to such ridicule. Hey, look, you'll be surprised the number of kids who have dropped out of school because of things like this. So, you know, I think that there are a lot of cultural things that we are grappling with. There is a lot of patriarchy in our society that also works against the course of women. There is child marriages that are still taking place in some communities. You spoke about the lynching of the 90-year-old woman. There's a certain level of poverty, there's a certain level of ignorance. There's a certain perception even about the old woman in any community, really. Because there's... You are women, you absolutely. Are old, you are poor, Excellent. You are Excellent. Person. There's a word called wizard. How often do you hear anybody? Very hard. Absolutely. So certainly, these are very, very disturbing things that are still happening. There's also female genital mutilation. There are lots of things that are still happening in our society. Cultural things. There's still some widowhood rights that are taking place that actually would lead to a woman even losing her life in the process. So certainly a lot of things that there's a litany of them, a raft of issues. We could have this conversation for oh, days okay. on. Uh, three young men made threats uh, towards a sitting judge in the election petition case. And a few people in the NDP, I don't know whether it was a few or a lot, um, went ahead and signed a petition for them to be released. And they ended up being released. And now when um, people who, you know, people who are gender advocates or people who are feminists, etc., try, try to um, sort of even feel excited about the nomination of the professor, it always keeps coming up that how can you say you are a feminist? How can you say you care about women when, you know, other women were threatened and another woman sort of made excuses for them to be released? And now you say you are for this woman. And I feel like, you know, obviously I would have preferred to speak to the professor herself about this particular, you know, issue to see what she was, to, to hear what exactly she was thinking or what went into, you know, that decision to do that. What exactly gave birth to the idea to make that petition for her herself as a woman, seeing some of the pronouncements these men had made to decide then to support their release? Mm. These were young men who had sat at a radio station very far away in terms of proximity. There was nowhere within the vicinity even of the courts, nowhere near the courts or even its environs, and had made some very unprintable remarks about the person of the then Chief Justice, who is a great woman by all standards, well-deserved, well and a fantastic human being, and a very professional individual. Indeed, they were subjected to a trial, they were sentenced, they served a month of that sentence. They paid a fine in addition. They showed deep remorse. They expressed apologies themselves and through many other outlets asking for a pardon. Indeed, remember that our constitution also allows for a president at any time to grant pardons. There are times when this pardon is used even to free prisoners. There are times when this pardon is used to free people, people who, who have committed actual, crime. actual crimes and stayed in prisons for a long time. The people believe that they've actually reformed. Know that there's a justice for all program currently going on. They even make recommendations for these people to be released because they have one shown remorse, they have changed, they have gone through some re rehabilitation and all of that. So certainly. So, you know, this is a matter that I think you see ever since this announcement was made. And uh, it speaks to how our politics has degenerated. 
they have tried very hard to find something. We heard about Delta Force guys who we know are affiliated to the New Patriotic Party who jumped into a court where a sitting high court judge, female and pregnant, to free their colleagues who were standing trial. We're still waiting for those perpetrators to be prosecuted. You know, I think that there was enormous politics around this matter. I believe that it actually divided even the NDC at the time, mm -hmm. right down the middle. I believe that those boys were caught up in that political space and certainly made some very, very unfortunate remarks. When Sir John, may he so rest in peace, was held for contempt, if you remember, mm -hmm. after the election petition, they were fined. There was one of them who broke down even and worked before the court. I believe these were individuals who were responsible and they individuals. Were responsible. And they were responsible, you know, but the, they were let go, right? but the, the, the passions that that judgment evoked led to this reaction for which they showed remorse and apologized. In fact, some of our own colleagues even went out there to advocate for them to be pardoned and for the apology to be accepted. I know the three who were involved in this ministry issue. I know they said some very heinous things, but I know the remorse that they expressed. And I know that they paid dearly for that. A month in a Ghanaian prison is no joke. For pronouncements. Absolutely. For whatever. You understand? They could have served the sentence of a year and probably not even receive any rehabilitation. Probably not be reoriented. Maybe not even think that what they did was wrong or unacceptable. But in this case, even in the course of the matter, they realized that they had erred in their ways. They apologized. They got many leading people to apologize on their behalf. I think it is a matter that has actually run its course. And since they have not repeated any of these offenses in the last few years, I believe strongly that this is just political chicanery as we see in this country. That it is a case where, once you know, look, I think we should rise above these things. We try too hard sometimes because of politics to create all of these little, little problems. Everybody who knows Dr. Mama knows that she's a very disciplined woman, knows that she's a very fair woman. I do not think that she took that decision lightly, that it was not necessarily just out of political expediency, but I believe that at some point she will address it herself, and I'm sure she probably wouldn't be put it any better than I have. But let us not make and start cherry picking and create something out of nothing. Those boys did not commit murder. They did not attack somebody. Yes, sometimes a threat is just as good as an attack because you would fear for your life. But they were far away in Mataiko. I am a very senior lawyer and I do not on any occasion want to appear to accept that someone can make such pronouncements against the office, not necessarily the person, of the Chief Justice and goes court free. I believe they were punished. I believe they expressed remorse. I believe that they paid a fine and they paid dearly by serving a sentence.